Last year, I released a video analyzing Moomin Valley in November by Tove Jansen, a striking book from the Moomin series that notably lacks any of the Moomin family. Several months afterwards, I released another video looking into Moomin Valley Midwinter, a book which serves as a deep dive into the character of Moomin Troll. Now, I want to talk about Moomin Papa at Sea, a strange and multi-layered narrative that touches on themes of isolation, exclusion, and existentialism. To do this, I'll be looking at the English translation of the text, as well as drawing from the Japanese and German versions. In some ways, Moomin Papa at Sea holds some similarities with Moomin Valley Midwinter. Both feature the primary characters interacting with the new environment that is resistant to them, with Midwinter featuring Moomin Valley covered in snow and ice, while At Sea takes place on an island supposedly located in the Gulf of Finland. But whereas the valley in Moomin Valley Midwinter is intentionally separate and unknowable to the Moomin characters, the island in At Sea serves as a metaphorical reflection of the woes and insecurities of the characters. And what are those insecurities? Well, let's take a look. Now of course, before we get into the video proper, I'd like to quickly take a moment to remind you to please like, comment, and subscribe. I got an algorithm to feed! Moomin Papa is going through a midlife crisis, feeling that he has no purpose and that nobody depends on him. He inflates the importance of minor situations to make himself seem all-knowing, staying up all night to watch a moss fire, warning the family that if he doesn't, they could all be burnt to a crisp. He fixates on a crystal ball in his garden, through which all of his property can be viewed. By imagining his family in the glass ball, Moomin Papa sees them in a lovingly possessive way, they belong to him, but in as much as he has to protect them. They are all encapsulated in a small orb that he presides over and can hold in the palm of his hand. Now, the proper thing to do is that they should begin an entirely new life, and that Moomin Papa should provide everything they need. The model lighthouse in his room, which he then goes out to search for, foreshadows the emptiness of his desire. He is attempting to project his fantasies on reality, find the lighthouse where he has perfect control, but when he actually finds it, he learns that he doesn't have quite as much control as he thought. He can't light the lighthouse, no matter how much he tries. He struggles to catch fish. He understands nothing about the island, and worse, begins to become estranged from his own family. He tries to assume the new role of lighthouse keeper, but he's nothing of the sort. He remains the same person he always was. The fisherman serves as the foil to Moomin Papa. Moomin Papa is obsessed with clout and attention, which the fisherman is unwilling to provide. As a result, Moomin Papa is motivated more than anything else, despite the fisherman. He finally becomes a chad of fishing despite his neighbor, extends hospitality to the fisherman when his house is destroyed, mainly to show that he is capable of doing so. Moomin Papa is the Finnish precursor to TikTok influencers buying huge houses to show off what they bought. But all this is a facade, and it's only when Moomin Papa finally accepts that he's not the lighthouse keeper and embraces his actual nature that he finds inner peace. The one similarity between Moomin Papa and the fishermen is that both were running from their true selves, and they must both return to their proper form. Moomin Papa seeks to explain everything he encounters in a logical and scientific way, through experiments. But the world of the Moomins isn't scientific, and as a result, his explanations come off as absurd. His invention and diagram of a sea leviathan causing the ebb and flow of an isolated rock pool seems like comical reaching, even in a world where such large creatures exist. Meanwhile, Moomin Troll has a far more spiritual outlook. His goals on the island are to connect with it. This is both in the social way of meeting the sea ponies, but also in the abstract sense of finding his own place in the island, the thicket. Even his dealings with the ponies have an unearthly quality to them, with him being fixated on their image, the dreamlike first encounter where he returns one of their horseshoes. But both approaches fail. Moomin Papa is unable to control the island, unable to explain it. He lacks critical information, but instead of finding it, he makes up his own explanations and accordingly fails to solve the problem. When the whole island, trees and all, begins moving away from the beach, Moomin Papa believes that the sea, a malevolent being, is intentionally frightening the island. He then tries to tell off the sea, 
but this obviously fails. If only he'd been closer to his son, Moomin Troll might have told him that the Grok had been visiting the beach, which is the true cause of the island's fright. In fact, the only time Moomin Papa has unbridled success is when he turns himself to the spiritual. Locked out of the lighthouse on arrival, Moomin Papa searches for the key. All logical places turn up empty. But then, in a scene reminiscent of the climax of the 1970 film The Railway Children, Moomin Papa enters a fugue state, wherein he spiritually enters the mind of the lighthouse keeper, and doing as he does, is able to precisely locate the key in an alcove in a rock wall at a secluded cove, as if the island had personally delivered it to him. Moomin Troll, on the other hand, faces the wall that the island has no interest in him. Despite his spiritual attempts to connect, he is rejected. The sea ponies mock him as a beta, despite his nice guy chivalry. Not only do they mock him, they also fat shame him. The thicket, his claimed home, is overrun by native ants, and his colonial attempt to take the thicket for himself by removing the ants destroys the magic of the location and ruins it. Even his attempt to connect with the Grok causes the rest of the island to become frightened and run from the eldritch being. Little Mai shares none of the romanticism of the other characters, and as a result, has none of their vulnerabilities. She has a hammer, and the world around her is full of nails. When the characters first arrive at the island, she sprints off into the unknown, with the other characters saying she can take care of herself. Moomin Papa wants to save the reveal of the lighthouse for himself, to revel in its significance. But when he gets to the door, Little Mai has not only arrived there first, but already found out that it's locked because the lighthouse has no personal significance to her. It's simply where she is right now. When the door is at last unlocked, she rushes in until Moomin Papa catches her, because he wants to save her his dominion over the lighthouse, while she is simply eager for adventure. Perhaps the most telling moment for her is how she deals with the ants of the thicket. Moomin Troll has a problem. There are ants in the thicket that he, as a white colonial, has decided is his. Now, let's be real, the Moomins do so much colonizing in this book, they aren't even Finnish, they're Dutch. Little Mai is tasked with removing them. So she does, by killing them all. She drowns them in toxic paraffin. Moomin Troll is aghast, but Little Mai chides him by reminding him of the truth he didn't want to accept. It would never be his thicket with the ants there, and there was no way they'd leave of their own accord. In this moment of heartlessness, Little Mai's philosophy is laid bare. Solve the problem, get what you want. It doesn't matter how it's done. Don't kid yourself about the dirty work. Despite her callousness, Little Mai is the only character to be generally successful. As the family fails to gently coax the fisherman into the lighthouse, she merely yells at him to sit down, and he finally does. Ironically, Little Mai is more hardened and prepared for sea life than Moomin Papa. She simply lacks the pretension. In all of these interweaving plot lines, Moomin Mama is left abandoned by the other characters. Throughout the early sections of the book, Moomin Mama is locked into the overly submissive role of housewife, forced to humor her husband's midlife crisis and, frankly, strange desire to isolate the whole family. Most of what she's able to do is wryly muse on her husband's actions. Moomin Mama thought, strange that people can be sad and even angry that life is too easy. She becomes progressively more bored with the fact that her husband provides everything for her, and perhaps a little annoyed at how poor a job he's doing. So, while still attempting to appear supportive, she decides to start sawing wood, a more traditionally masculine chore, and even refuses to allow Moomin Papa to do it for her. Soon, she begins to paint, completely recreating the valley home they left. Her painting gains such a metaphysical power that in the single strangest moment of the book, she steps behind a tree that she has painted onto the wall, and becomes invisible to the other family members. This is the epitome of her abandoning the island. Much in the way Moomin Papa wanted to create his own bubble and insert others into it, she has created her own bubble in response, as unreachable to others as Moomin Papa's own fantasies. She is metaphorically rejecting Moomin Papa's vision, choosing to take herself out of the life he has created, even though she can't physically leave. Perhaps there's a feminist angle to be seen here. This was written in the late 60s, where the role of women was still contested and often confined to the house. 
What if Jansen, a lesbian woman who later took on a female partner for the remainder of her life, wants to critique the male desire to be patriarchal by showing the patriarch Mumbapa as somewhat impotent in contrast to his fantasy of prowess? It's just a thought. Regardless, eventually Moomin Mama completely asserts her independence, visiting Moomin Troll in the thicket at night, still at least humoring at Moomin Papa in an attempt to preserve his sanity while he fails at everything he tries, mansplaining it all the while. As part of my research for this, I read through the Japanese and German translations of the novel. Translations are rewrites, reimaginings by other authors, as no language can 100% translate into another. As I've grown up reading the English versions, not the original Swedish, I've never actually read Janssen's own words, just Kingsley Hearts. Perhaps the German version is closer because Swedish is a Germanic language, but there will always be interesting differences, and as such, no translation can reign supreme. For the Japanese version by Yuriko Onodera, I'd like to talk about how it portrays the Grok. In the Japanese version, and in fact in the original Swedish, the Grok is called the Moran. The Moran is an eternal observer, unable to interact with others. As a result, even short passages with the Moran burn through multiple synonyms for looking. Nagameru, mitomeru, miwataseru, mitsumeru are all words for look and gaze that imply length of time, obsession, fixation. Noronoro, yukkuri, shibaraku, tachidomaru, taizu, nagai aida are words for sluggishness, slowness, eternity. The Moran doesn't worry about haste. Even when seeing that the family is abandoning the island and taking the precious lamp with them, she's not worried about rushing. She will take as much time as she needs. Perhaps this is from the knowledge that even when she arrives at the island to see the lamp again, all she can do is observe it. She can't interact with the flame because that would destroy it. She can barely interact with others because they don't understand her and she has nothing to say. She is eternally on the other side of the window, the outside looking in. Much like the book's first chapter where her presence scares the family and causes them to retreat into the safety and warmth of their house, leaving her in the cold. What a strange character. Even now, I'm not sure of the purpose of the Moran. Why would Jensen create such an isolated character, so lost? In earlier books, the Moran was a one-note villain. She'd show up, be a threat, then leave. It's only in this book that we learn anything of what's inside her. Following the dark trend of the later books, could the Moran be a way for Jansen to express her own feelings of sadness? In a book where the characters feel trapped on an island, the Moran is the only one trapped within herself. For the German translation done by Brigitte Kischerer, I'd like to look at the portrayal of Mumenpapa, or Mumenvater, through an interesting use of grammar. German is a highly agglutinative language, where the meanings of words are altered by fragments attached to the words, much more than in English. These fragments can serve as prefixes and suffixes. One such fragment is los. Los typically implies a lack of something, destruction, or a removal. Los can resemble the English suffix less. Something regulus is motionless. Meanwhile, to go away would be los gehen, where what's less is you. If something is erloschen, it's extinguished. A solution to a problem is eine Lösung, because los and its derivatives also mean to dissolve. This fragment is used in abundance to describe Mubenvater and how he looks at others. He is ziellos, aimless, planless, planless. He wants to los segen, sail away. During the boat journey to the island, he looks at his family and sees that they looked just as small and helpless, hilflos, as in the crystal ball, once again projecting his desire to overly protect them. By repeatedly using the suffix to describe Mumvater, he is presented in the story more through what he isn't than what he is. He is not described through grammatical positives, but negatives. If this book is about getting to the core of Mumvater's character, then the grammar acts as a question. Who is he? These are things he is not. This is what he sees is not in the world, but what is actually there? This feeds into his midlife crisis narrative. Moon Papa feels useless, like nothing, which kickstarts the whole lighthouse fantasy, and the text supports this by portraying him through grammatical nothings. 
Also, as this is my second time reading through the German version, I finally get to do my favorite thing with German texts, which is to collect absurdly long words. Some of my favorites this time around include Verbarricadieren, which means to barricade yourself in, and Zusammengerollten, which means roll together. So we've seen the characters become isolated, each constructing their own world. All of the characters interact with the island and the sea and have core aspects of their being reflected back at them. But through all of this, there comes an interesting question. Why islands? Why the sea? Why isolation? What fueled Tove Jensen to write this? If only there were text that could tell us more. Published in 1972, The Summer Book is a novel about an elderly illustrator and her granddaughter, who live at a summer home on an island in the Gulf of Finland. The novel is very clearly inspired by Jansen's own life. The grandmother is based on Jansen's mother, Signe Hammerstein Jansen, while the granddaughter is based on her niece. Jansen's family owned a small island in the Gulf themselves and would use it as a summer home. Although some elements of the episodic and fragmentary plot are likely inspired by actual conversations between Signe Hammerstein and her granddaughter, most of the perspective of the grandmother likely reflects the thought of Tove Jansen herself, as she considered her mother's death the year prior, and her own aging. Through her writing as the unnamed grandmother character, Jansen explores many similar themes as Moom Papa at Sea. Right from the beginning we get parallels to Moom Troll's thicket, with the grandmother finding her own isolated thicket, even lying on her back and looking up the light in the same manner as Moom Troll. Much consideration is given to isolation and quiet space, to the small moments of serenity. The Papa character in the novel, based on Jensen's real-life brother and father to her niece, strongly correlates to Moom Papa. He is obsessed with science and projects, spending most of his time shut away in his study and aloof, leaving his child to wander the island. There's even a shared subplot about the father figure in both novels being concerned with the water level of a pool on the island. Although, whereas Moom Papa figures it's due to a hidden leviathan, the summer book's subplot culminates in a giant rubber sausage. Furthermore, the idea of the island being alive is also shared. In a metaphorical paragraph, Jensen describes how the island creeps away from the shore as winter approaches. This is meant as a poetic representation of how people are less likely to go out in the cold and so leave their tools closer to the house, but the anthropomorphizing of the island shows a strong similarity to Moom Papa at Sea, where the entire island gradually moves away from the coast in fear of the grove. Throughout the novel, Jensen also explores the importance of being connected to the environment and being a true islander. Several chapters are devoted to outsiders, newcomers who have purchased their own islands but are unconnected to the sea life. Much as Moom Papa prides himself as being a true sailor, living off the sea, the grandmother views herself as superior in a way to the Nouveau residents because she has been going to the islands her entire life and is hardened by the way of living. Still, much as Moom Papa begins to forget his own past and lose the skills he once had, the grandmother deals with her own aging. She worries that the things which set her apart and what she was once able to do are now being lost. She worries, as well as an elderly friend who visits later in the book, that she herself will become useless, much as Moom Vater felt überflüssig in the first page of the German translation. Overall, the summer book serves as an indication that the island culture of living as an isolated and self-sustained family unit in the Gulf of Finland has been a part of Tove Jansen for her entire life. It was her childhood, her adulthood, even afterwards in her old age. Moom Papa at Sea is an encapsulation of that way of living. The book contains elements of nostalgia for the adventure she once had, alienation from others as well as the fear that the livelihood will be lost with age. If the summer book is geared towards mature adults, perhaps Moom Papa at Sea, which is more for children, serves as Jansen trying to communicate her lifestyle to a younger generation. As she ages, she would see the city life gradually take over, with the islands being relegated to the same aging families before being lost forever. Perhaps then Moom Papa at Sea is a time capsule, Jansen's attempt to communicate her own personal experience and the magic of it before it's lost to the world and herself. Moomin Papa at Sea is a strange send-off to the Moomin family. Although there is one more book in the series, Moomin Valley in November doesn't actually feature the Moomins themselves. 
Moomin Papa at Sea is their last starring appearance. A lot of the comments on my Moomin Valley November video talk about Jansen's struggles with her own work, about burnout, and the conflicting views of the Moomins. I think those themes can also be clearly seen throughout this book, and perhaps act as a central motivator for the writing. While it might seem weird to leave the Moomins as they are, alone on an island, Jansen is in fact concentrating on the most important things about them. What is the essence of their characters? What is the point of their stories? Why do people like them in the first place? When you strip everything away and look at their very core, who are the Moomins? Well, if you've made it this far, I'd like to thank you for watching. On the screen now, you'll see the portal to my analysis of Moom Valley in November, the final book in the series that doesn't even feature the Moomins. I've also left a link to my analysis of Moom Valley Midwinter in the description. As always, please like and subscribe, tell me in the comments what the Moomins mean to you, and I'll see you again.